live from the MGM Grand Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's The Q at Splunk.com 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Splunk. Here are your hosts, Jeff Kelly and Jeff Frick. Hi, welcome back, everyone. You're watching The Cube. We're at Splunk.com 2014, uh, the fifth annual Splunk User Conference. I'm Jeff Frick and The Cube. We've been here for three years. We go out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. We try to find the smartest people we can and get them on The Cube, ask them the questions that you'd like to hear from them. And we love the Splunk shows because they get a whole lot of practitioners, people that are actually executing with the technology, implementing the technology, transforming their business, transforming their companies, and so we, uh, we love coming here three years in a row. I'm sure we'll be back next year. I'm joining this next segment by my co-host, Jeff Kelly. Thanks, Jeff. And we've got Jim Nichols with us. He's cloud architect for a company called, and I'm hoping I'm getting this right, Enernock, is yep. that correct? Fantastic. Um, Jim, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about Enernock and uh, what business you're in, and, and then we'll get into kind of uh, how you're using Splunk. So Enernock is the industry leading provider of software based uh, solutions for energy intelligence software. Uh, so we have uh, 30,000 energy sensors deployed around the world in we are measuring the energy of the top industrial, institutional customers and commercial customers uh, and helping them maximize how they're using their energy. Mm -hmm. So that's a clearly a very data intensive business. Absolutely, and um, it just keeps getting worse. Yep. <laughs> worse or better, I don't know. Better. <laughs> it depends on your perspective. Depends on your, yeah, the perspective. So, so your role is cloud architect, so you deliver uh, your services from a cloud perspective? Yep, so we do, Splunk is all, all in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that footprint in all of our new initiatives, our big data initiatives are 100% cloud based. Uh, we do still have a hybrid model though where we do still have some on-premises uh, solutions, but um, my role is to uh, lead the way to architect these cloud-based solutions and uh, going forward that's where 100% of our development's going to be. Mm -hmm. Interesting, so I, I definitely want to talk about that, but maybe if you could add a little color um, in terms of one of your customers and the use case, specifically uh, what sure. you're doing for them. Yep, so we help our customers with uh, three phases of energy management, how they buy their energy, when they use it and how they use it. Um, and basically the, the data uh, that we're collecting from their energy meters is driving everything and we have analytics, we have reports, we have alerts, we have emails, um, and we have all those types of tools that allow them to get the most out of their energy. So they can understand uh, trends and how they're using energy when they're having you know, peak times. And exactly. How yep. that relates to the price of energy. And right, so the peak time example um, is kind of our core bread and butter where we initially got our start. So on the hottest summer days, the grid operators can either start up a power plant if they need capacity, mm -hmm. or they can call in or knock, and our technology will help reduce our customers' energy usage in real time so they don't have to turn on the power plant. Now are these customers largely industrial customers with huge energy uses? Oh yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. So it's we're going after the, the top users of energy, so uh, heavy industry, uh, manufacturing, hospitals, campuses and universities, mm -hmm. Um, all 100% commercial, industrial, and institutional customers. So do you sit kind of in between the energy providers and, and, and the customer? Uh, because you know, we're hearing some of the energy providers trying to get into this business and, and provide some analysis with smart meters of, yep. of energy usage of their clients. So, so depending on um, you know, which program that we're in, we're actually doing a little bit of both, a little mm -hmm. bit of everything depending on the geographic region. So in some areas we contract with the utility directly and we're providing like either demand response for them or helping run in their energy efficiency program. Um, and then in some cases we're working with a grid operator uh, in a regulated market and um, we bid in just like we're a power plant and instead of provide, burning things and producing energy, we're turning things off to uh, provide the capacity. So kind of sit those dual roles and then as we've moved more into um, enterprise software solutions, mm -hmm. um, it's more working directly with the customer. So we're enabling their um, data from their energy meters uh, back into our platform and providing the analytics for them and it's just for them and there's no um, utility or grid operator or anybody else involved, it's just us and them trying to uh, give them real enterprise grade solutions to manage their energy and make it kind of as easy to do as accounting. Maybe not as easy to do but similar to accounting, yep. have ERP systems and so forth and we're trying to do that for energy. 
So we're always asking for where's the ROI and things are more efficient and this and that, but in this business, in your use case, there's big ROI, right? Small, small oh, deltas in consumption relate to easily measurable dollars. Oh, absolutely. So on those, those peak summer days, um, when the grid is the most constrained for resources, the price of energy can be exponentially higher than it is even 10 or 12 hours before or after. So if the customer reduces their energy during those peak periods of times, it can be extremely lucrative for just an hour or two, just stop and turn the air conditioning down or stop the manufacturing line for a little bit and they can make serious um, money doing that. Um, and then, same thing on the energy efficiency side. All of the tools that we're building is trying to make it really easy for them to identify these energy efficiency opportunities and associate a dollar amount directly to that it, mitigation measure, whatever it is, so right. that they can implement it and then see right away what the value is going to be immediately. Conversely, you shut a line down for a little bit, there's a whole different kind of financial impact. So do you integrate with other systems on their side so they can make a, an educated decision as to how to, to throttle that mm -hmm. up and down? Oh, absolutely. So the main thing that we're pulling in, we're pulling in for every single customer their energy usage. So we have a hardware device that we place next to their uh, electrical meter uh, that's getting their data um, every five minutes all the way down to every two seconds. We're doing that for everybody, and then depending on the customer's needs, we're also pulling in manufacturing data, weather information, occupancy information about their building. That's data that's specific to them. Um, like for example, you wouldn't want to run the air conditioning if it's a Monday, a, a, a federal holiday on a Monday, and you're running the air conditioner, there's nobody in the building. That's a savings opportunity right there. So um, that's the type of thing that we're, we're doing for them. So uh, talk a little bit about the, your analytics environment. You're talking about some big data analytics challenges there. How are you going about that? I'm sure Splunk plays a role, but maybe take a, take a step back you know, beyond just Splunk. Kind of what's your technology footprint look like? What are you doing? What tools are you using? How are you actually going about doing that right. sophisticated analytics? So um, when we first started, um, there wasn't really such a thing as, as big data. There was no cloud. There was nothing like that. And we uh, have had a lot of great success with the Oracle database. and. We run at Exadata um, in our environment and we got amazing return on the investment and we were able to move into more new programs than any of our, our competitors. We're a worldwide company and not having to build the infrastructure um, at the time, in addition to building the new functionality, um, mm -hmm. really helped us. Um, but now that a lot of these tools are becoming more mature, we're using HBase, MongoDB, uh, you know, you name it, we've tried it. We're using um, a few really heavily now for a new demand management product that we're offering that's helping predict how much energy a customer is going to use in the future using um, some real sophisticated uh, data analysis. Uh, we have a, a, our lead data scientist is a MIT PhD. Um, I believe it's in physics. Um, and she's applying uh, those types of tools and technologies to the energy data, uh, trying to you know, find the insights in the energy usage that aren't things that people know. We do have experts in Enernoc that know um, if you're running an HVAC, HVAC system and it's cooler outside than it's you know, cooler inside, you don't need to run the chiller, you can just kind of open the window and pull in the <laughs> fresh air. And a lot of those things we know, and we have people, we have like 10,000 years of experience or something mm -hmm. doing that, but there are other insights that only the data will present, and it's the non-obvious things, and we're trying to use those types of analytical tools mm -hmm. to find those types of opportunities. Can you give an example of one of those non-obvious things that's the, that the data can, uh, provides the insights around? Um, unfortunately, I can't uh, go there for you. Um, <laughs> okay, no, no worries. I have, there, there are some that are non-obvious, um, and then when you hear it, it's like, okay, well, that is obvious, <laughs> um, but uh, that is our it's your, it's your that's secret, secret sauce, sauce and, right yeah, there. Well, we, we've got to ask. We, <laughs> we love to hear those stories when we can get them, but I uh, totally understand. But so the, the tool set, though, we're, you know, we're using MongoDB, we're mm -hmm. using HBase, Hadoop, we're using all those things, and mm -hmm. those are the, the tool sets that we're using along with Splunk to, to get those insights. So. Great, so before we get to Splunk, you're in a great position to provide a little bit of um, color around how the old world and the new world are kind of colliding and uh, how the new world of Hadoop and these kind of open source distributed um, frameworks are impacting the old world, 
the Oracle being kind of one of the poster children of that old world, mm -hmm. you're using X data. How do you see that relationship? Do you see uh, these new approaches pushing against kind of the old approaches, the more rigid approaches? Um, or how's that playing out, I should say, in your organization? For us, um, you know, the 100% of the new development's going to be out in the cloud. Um, but we still have the Exadata, the, the, a lot of the core business is still there and it's mm -hmm. not going away anytime soon. Um, we have a, a true hybrid approach, mm -hmm. um, so we're getting the data just as it's going into Oracle so that we can then uh, put it out into the cloud and have the exact same data set in both places. Mm -hmm. um, but then we can run kind of the mission critical um, operations. So like when we're doing demand response for a grid operator, uh, we're doing that to help avoid like blackouts and brownouts and there are like life safety issues involved. We're doing generators at hospitals, and um, you know I think the AWS Force reboots that went on last weekend are a good example of uh, truly mission critical things like that, where life safety is involved. That I think that the cloud's not quite there yet, mm -hmm. um, but what it is there for is for elastic computing. It's for spin stuff up, try it out, throw it away, try something else, and we've done a whole lot of that, that if we had tried to do that internally on Oracle, it would have been a, a, a much larger effort. It wouldn't have been impossible. I think it's possible either way, but um, it would have been a lot harder and a lot slower. And a lot more expensive. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, so let's talk about Splunk specifically. So what role is Splunk playing um, in this larger picture that you've uh, painted for us? So I bought Splunk initially uh, to do web log analysis. I had built like a custom homegrown thing and Enernock, it's been an amazing story. It's grown incredibly uh, quickly, um, you know, since we went public um, and my homegrown thing just couldn't keep up anymore. So <laughs> I bought Splunk to do the web log analysis and I did that within a couple of days. Haven't gone back to it since because we delivered a new demand response program um, that had technology requirements that were, it was analogous to like, we need to put somebody on the moon and we have barely working rockets. Never put anybody into low orbit and to achieve the implementation and make the thing work where we're taking the energy data from our customer sites, getting it into our, uh, into our infrastructure, mm -hmm. doing some aggregation, and then sending it back to the grid operator within five seconds. Mm -hmm. um, being able to achieve that was an amazing accomplishment for us. Um, but what we didn't do was any of the operational visibility. Um, as we were building it, we we're trying to figure out what we we're trying to build, we we're trying to do it, and kind of assume that the data would always come in five seconds, which it doesn't always come <laughs> in five seconds. So right before we shipped it, it was about a month before, or a month after I had got Splunk, so I threw together a, a quick dashboard um, that is looking at the uh, demand response program itself and how the system operations are impacting our performance and mm -hmm. meeting our compliance requirements with the, with the grid operator. And, that really paid for Splunk tenfold. Um, you know, the investment in Splunk, if we had tried to build all that with our development team, we, we could have done it, but it would have been 10 times as expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but so we're using it mainly for that, that system's operational visibility, but then in a few key places we're using it where it's kind of this intersection between running the software, running the system, and then uh, also running like the demand response program. So we have dashboards that'll have like system performance, what's the latency of the data, and then like how many megawatts are we sending them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really interesting intersection of those two worlds. Yeah, it, it seems like you certainly expanded some of the, your use cases, which is kind of a common theme, Jeff, that we're hearing uh, yep. here at the show with all the customers we've had on. Uh, oh, absolutely. The um, and so does Splunk make it easy to do that? Certainly it does from a, the technology perspective, from um, their kind of approach to licensing and the kind of try before you buy. Do they make it easy to do that? Oh, absolutely. I, um, I could do a lot with the, the five gig trial license or the free 500, or 500 uh, meg uh, trial license. And then uh, I was able to get a larger trial license uh, and start to show some of the value. And I was really immediately able to show that we're going to be able to get value out of this, and you know, in terms of the dollars, um, it was right in the range of a lot of the other types of like performance monitoring tools that we had gotten, and um, it was a real easy sell, and we kind of proved the investment pretty quickly with it. 
Mm -hmm. So we've been talking on the cube. Another another thing that keeps seems to keep coming up at the show this year is uh, DevOps. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of what you described, the scenario you described, um, I think fits into that paradigm. Um, and, and in fact, on the previous uh, segment, we were talking about you know what comes first in a DevOps perspective, the culture that needs to go along with that to make it happen, or the tooling that you need to actually implement it. Um, what's your approach uh, in your organization, or what's your thoughts on DevOps, just the term, the concept? Do you think it's, uh, is that accurate in describing what you're doing, and, and how is Splunk helping you do that? Yeah, I mean, personally, I feel like I've been doing DevOps at Enernox <laughs> since day one, 2007. Um, it's always been to me about running that production system, making sure it's performing, and I think that it's great that we have DevOps. It's kind of an umbrella term that kind of encompasses a lot of these things, and it kind of helps make it a little bit more concrete. Um, in terms of DevOps, I actually gave a presentation here um, at, at the conference on how Splunk is helping enable our DevOps, really the knowledge, the sharing, and the collaboration mm -hmm. piece. So we'll have a developer. We actually have a development manager that built a dashboard. Um, he used to be a coder, but I guess you could consider him a non-technical person now. And he, he put this dashboard together because we're delivering um, a new feature, um, and we wanted to make sure that it was going to perform well uh, when we released into production. So he built this dashboard, and then when he meets with the operations folks to do like the technical handoff, it's based around the discussion around this dashboard. So mm -hmm. these are the metrics. You know, he's the expert. He knows what they are, and then that kind of forces that sharing of the information. Mm -hmm. So you get the, the so for Cam, the Cams in DevOps, it's collaboration piece, we're getting that, we're getting the measurement piece, and then the, the sharing piece. And it's really around, around those shared dashboards, and um, everybody is, is uh, kind of drinking the Kool-Aid at this point. The developers are doing the logs better. Um, one of the really great success stories, I think, for Splunk, um, kind of this DevOps uh, place, is that we had an application support person that was totally uh, end user facing, taking phone calls about like can't log into the software, or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. types of problems there were. A non-technical person that had a um, liberal arts degree from somewhere. <laughs> um, and they basically became the number one user of Splunk pretty quickly. Um, started doing some really deep technical troubleshooting. And uh, over time, um, basically carved out a role for themselves in engineering. We stole them out of app support, <laughs> mm -hmm. put them in engineering, and now this person is the production operations lead. The whole kind of mm -hmm. world revolves around them, and they're uh, digging into the technology. And without Splunk, I don't really, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine how else that would have happened. Mm -hmm. And did that person start to build their own dashboards? I mean, did they you know, really start to to, to explore with the tool along their own kind of journey? Oh, absolutely, yep. They um, not only started make, t building their own dashboards, but modifying dashboards that I had made and then not letting me make any changes to them. <laughs> and they owned them, which, you know, I wish I could have planned that, but they certainly took ownership of it. And they're doing all the alerts. They're doing dashboards. They're working with the developers on better logging and getting the forwarder set up. and really has kind of taken the ownership of it because it was a key tool for them to be able to do their job. Um, even though it's weird, it kind of, the job kind of created, was kind of created itself right. to be in Splunk, to be doing this type of thing. It didn't really exist before, but uh, it's really kind of driven all the activity that they're doing in there in Splunk every day pretty much now. But it's a law of unintended consequences as long as it's a combination of someone's motivation, you mm -hmm. know, an opportunity to exploit that motivation using a tool and the data to redefine a new job, like you said, that wasn't even uh, defined there before. So, it, you know, letting, letting employees, you know, be self-advocates and mm -hmm. execute their own little vision using available data and available tools. Yeah, and if you can use Excel, uh, you can go in there and you can create some pretty slick looking dashboards and run a, um, you know, a query against, you know, I have five years worth of log data in there at this point. Um, run a query over that whole data set and point and click and configure things. And then if you need to do something a little bit more complicated, you might have to get one of the Splunk experts involved, which is, Really, there's only two of us, but we can support everybody um, that is using it right now. And there, uh, people have been in there. We have vice presidents that are in there looking at 
how many of their employees have logged into our platform. So <laughs> the uh, drinking your own Coke, I think, is the example that we heard yesterday, or dog fooding is another uh, um, example of that. But uh, you know, they're, they're in there modifying the search, and they're seeing who's logging in. And, and uh, you know, I had a, another debate with another vice president over the difference between like a gauge and a dial, like where kind of data visualization like nerds at Enernoc, and those are some of the debates that we end up having, but it's, it's pretty amazing to have a, a software tool that we bought to look at web logs that now we're arguing about what's a gauge versus a dial on a dashboard that we have in our network operations center. It's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. Yeah, so expand on that a little bit in terms of the empowerment and really the change in the conversation when you go from data that was hidden, unexposed, buried, it's certainly not accessible to everyone, <laughs> now it's out there, now it's more of a conversation about what's the right presentation layer. I mean, that, that's a pretty big transformation. Right, I mean, the, the data before was completely opaque. Um, you know, I uh, started off as a performance engineer at Enernoc, digging into the logs. I used to be able to tail it and watch the log go by and like, like the matrix, reading it and seeing what was happening in the system. And as we grew it, I couldn't do that anymore and it was really, me and a couple of the other people that had been there some in the beginning that kind of knew, oh, that there's a log message for that, we can grep for it, we can dig in there for it, and now it's just as easy. If, if you can use Google, you can just put in an error message that somebody got in the UI, throw it into Splunk and see what it comes back with, and non-technical people are able to kind of, it makes it accessible for them, really. So you've got Splunk's ear right now. They're all, they're all watching, uh, if not now, <laughs> later. What are some things they can do for you to help you execute better as, as you move forward? Well, so we, we are a mission critical uh, operation for demand response and because Splunk is monitoring the platform, it really needs to be as mission critical and as reliable, if not more, than the platform. So on the platform side, we've you know, built and embraced that failures are going to happen and built in redundancy and fault tolerance and all that sort of thing. And we really need Splunk there to be able to watch that, to know what's going on. It's the, the Immersat flight data recorder. Um, it was really one of the first key things that we put out in Amazon so that if we completely lost one of our data centers, we'd be able to log into Splunk and, and see what's happening. So that high availability mission critical piece is really our biggest sort of want, and they actually kind of answered the question for us. It was kind of amazing actually yesterday to hear that they're doing more with search head clustering to be able to enable high availability, and that was really like the key thing that we were after, so we'll have to think a little bit about what else we would like to see in there, but um, I think it's mainly around that theme of making it highly available and self-healing and able to tolerate Amazon failures more, uh, more robustly and that type of thing, I think is the main, uh, the main want that we have. All right, good. So thanks for coming on, great story. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, it's great learning about new businesses where you guys are impacting significant amounts of dollars, not to mention it's, it's environmentally the right thing to do to, uh, to help conserve energy and efficiently put the energy where it needs to be and take it away from the office on Monday afternoon and Memorial Day when there's nobody in there. Absolutely. So, and Jim Nichols, from uh, Internoc, thanks for stopping by theCUBE. Uh, I'm Jeff Frick with Jeff Kelly. We're at Splunk.conf 2014, the fifth year of Splunk's user conference, the third year of bringing theCUBE. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise and get great guests like Jim uh, to tell you how they're using these technologies and trying to change the world, change their business, and change really the culture within their companies, and powering other people within the organization to more aggressively get out in front of the curve and make changes and really uh, be innovative. So we'll be right back with our next segment after this short break.